Welcome everyone to another presentation of our HKS Limitless series, Social Equity and Transit-Oriented Development. A bit of housekeeping first. To get credit for today's event, click the below link and fill out your information. AIA members will have their credit reported and other organizational members will receive a certificate to self-report. Also, if you have any questions for our panelists, please submit your questions through the Q&A function on the platform and we will respond to your inquiries during our panel discussion. During today's session, leaders in city governments, real estate strategy, and smart enterprises will discuss how the built environment impacts emotional, physical, and social welfare of populations served by transit-oriented developments, and what it will take to leverage re relationships for betterment of our people and places. Now, I will introduce our host for today, Kate Campbell, Director of Business Development. Thank you, Ashley. Mobility and equity have long been standing, have been a long-standing area of disparity among us. As such, the topic of social equity and transit-oriented developments is extremely critical to communities all over the globe, since it connects to all aspects of equity, sustainability, and governance. It is my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Rosalind Huey. Rosalind serves as the Deputy City Manager for the City of San Jose and provides leadership for the broad area of community and economic development and strategic coordination for city departments shaping the future of San Jose, including planning, housing, economic development, cultural affairs, and transportation. Rosalind is responsible for citywide enterprise priorities related to community and economic recovery of COVID-19, the future of downtown and development of the Deardon Station Area Transit Hub, housing policy and production, and development services. She is passionate about city building, civic engagement, and leading with people. With a career in urban planning that spans over 30 years, Rosalind Huey understands the intersectionality of land use, housing, transportation, economic development, placemaking, and sustainability. Prior to joining the city of San Jose, Rosalind served as the deputy director in Washington, D.C. Office of Planning, where she led dozens of neighborhood and transit-oriented development plans and large-scale planning and redevelopment projects. Rosalind holds a bachelor's degree in urban studies from the University of Maryland College Park. She's a senior fellow of the American Leadership Forum, Silicon Valley, and a member of the American Planning Association. She is also an active member of the Urban Land Institute, serving on the executive board of the San Francisco District Council and is co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Without further ado, please welcome Rosalind. Hello, and thank you so much, Kate, for that introduction. I really do appreciate that, and I'm really delighted to be with all of you today. Um, I was um, actually a bit surprised um, when I got the invitation from both Kate and Sheba. Uh, they reached out to me regarding this event, and I do want to acknowledge my colleague, uh, who's a panelist on this call, Rachel Flynn, um, who pointed uh, Sheba and Kate to the city of San Jose and our equitable development work. Um, and Rachel, I want to let you know that I do feel a special connection to you because I am born and raised in Virginia. So uh -huh. thank you for all of your great contributions um, to the state and to your community in, in Fairfax. Thanks, um, Rosalind. <laughs> certainly. And also, I just want to acknowledge um, just really um, a delight to be with all of these distinguished panelists this afternoon, and they're just doing tremendous work. Um, in their own communities. Um, and I just want to also just thank um, HKS um, and its leadership for designing this panel and the dialogue and just um, for being a leader in the equity space. Um, it is critical, I think, that we come together to share, to learn, to encourage one another, to take courageous actions, to make a difference in land use and planning, design and economic and real estate development. I really do appreciate the title of the series, Limitless. I love that. <laughs> I think that we can all agree that we're in a time and a space where we have to stretch ourselves beyond if we really think that we're going to make an impact and see positive change in our communities. We have certainly been through a lot these past 15 months. 
a global pandemic that has turned our lives absolutely upside down. We've had loss of lives. Families have been devastated. Loss of jobs and income. And I know in our community, um, we've had volunteers and city workers who have been distributing food to people who need it. We've worked to build emergency housing to, to house our unhoused residents. We've created learning pods for our children and we've been caring for our loved ones. We've witnessed black people murdered across this country and the call for justice and police reform. In California, we've had devastating wildfires and at the same time dealing with the housing and homelessness crisis that we've never seen before. And just two weeks ago from today, our community was wrecked yes, yet again by the mass shooting at our regional transportation authority located just, just blocks away from our city hall and, and the core of our downtown. Many of us have become unnerved and really are just plain exhausted. And yet there is this resilience, this commitment, what I call this hunkering down and leaning into change and to action. And honestly, as leaders, we really don't have any other choice but to continue our work. The experience of pain can be a good thing, actually. It lets you know that something is wrong and that something is out of order. And in planning, design, development, and real estate, we've had to acknowledge how our professions have actually played a role, and in many cases, a significant role in systemic racism throughout our country. We've been asking who's benefited and who has been burdened by housing, health, education, transportation, and economic policies over decades in our country's history. This is the essence of our racial and social equity discourse. We're acknowledging, we're listening, we're reading, we're learning, we're engaging. And this is all good because we all are at different levels in our understanding and we all bring our own lived experiences. And certainly knowledge is powerful and applied knowledge is wisdom. And so I believe we are so very blessed to have some amazing thought leaders and their research and their work. We've been looking to books like The Color of Law, The Sum of Us, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And here in San Jose, we have The Devil in Silicon Valley. And I know that you are not just interested in learning, but in challenging yourselves to actually do something or else I know you wouldn't be spending your time on the Zoom call today. I wanna take the time to share with you about a policy discussion that just occurred last night with our city council. Our housing department is leading an assessment of fair housing that will be used to ensure that San Jose complies with new state law. And in short, jurisdictions throughout California have a duty both to reduce barriers to fair housing and to invest in low income, racially concentrated communities to make those areas places of opportunity. Although assessment is a fair housing is still not required by federal regulation, we know that President Biden has expressed support for reinstating affirmatively furthering fair housing during his administration. And in San Jose, our assessment will be used to ensure that our programs are consistent with fair housing principles that will really form the foundation of the city's next housing element of its general plan and our future racial equity work. This in fact is the very first time our city has conducted 
and in-depth analysis of residential segregation and access to opportunity. Our housing staff shared their initial findings and not surprisingly, they found that Black, Indigenous, Latinx households experience homelessness in our city at a greater rate than the rest of the city's population. Latinx and Black households experience disproportionate housing needs, including housing cost burden, overcrowding, and housing quality problems, such as the lack of complete kitchen facilities and complete plumbing facilities. And yes, this is in Silicon Valley, the hottest economy on the globe. Residential displacement in the Bay Area disproportionately impacts Black and Latinx residents and is leading to a new regional pattern of resegregation. Re Market discrimination continues to be an issue and fair housing organizations are not sufficiently resourced to meet the outstanding need. Some residents have shared with us, they've told their stories of being denied housing or were being evicted because they simply had children. And our disabled residents have shared widespread challenges in obtaining reasonable accommodations. Our city council was very receptive of the data that the housing staff presented last night. And they had a healthy discussion um, about the legacies of racial discrimination, such as redlining and racially restrictive covenants that have impacted the ability of people of color to generate wealth. One council member who is, happens to also be a real estate professional shared that she had read The Color of Law last year. And she shared that she realized she didn't know what she didn't know. And she shared her pain after reading the book and how she really truly wanted to make a difference. And so she was excited to share that not only can she help her clients and future clients, but as a city council member, as a lawmaker, she now has the opportunity to create policies that will make changes for our entire city. That was certainly a proud moment for many of us in San Jose last night. And I believe we need many, many more of these kind of moments. Before I go on to strategies and actions and sharing an example from San Jose, I thought I'd just take a moment to address social equity. And social equity is concerned about justice and fairness of social policy. In San Jose, we look to thought leaders and partners in our work. And PolicyLink, who I'm sure you're familiar with, is a national research and action institute advancing racial and economic equity by lifting up what works. Policy length defines equity as just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. Unlocking the promise of the nation by unleashing the promise in us all. And similarly, I believe equity is about outcomes. Cities want good outcomes for all of its residents, no matter what you look like, where you were born, your gender, how old you are, where you live, where you go to school, or your abilities. We know that by helping those most in need that we actually lift up our entire community. And by lifting up those who have been marginalized and burdened by impacts of institutional racism, most burdened by the COVID impacts, by lifting these, our people up, we certainly lift up everyone. And this work is grounded, what I call grounded in we. <laughs> there is no choosing sides because we see everyone as our neighbor. There are no winners and there are no losers. 
There's no us versus them. It's about the collective good. And we know that we have to extend empathy. That is, we choose to understand a person's situations from their perspective and not from our own. So we are people-centered and we know we must lead with people. And I believe this is the shift in our profession as well. So this leads me to a few concepts or tools to use. First thing I wanna mention is embracing the 15 minute city concept. And I'll admit that this is a vision for urban living, but I think it's appropriate. I'm sure we have many good urbanists on our call today. What I like about the 15, city, 15 minute city is that it's actually not about mobility, but it's about accessibility to what people need in their everyday lives. This must include community scale, education and healthcare, essential retail like grocery stores, parks for recreation and public spaces for gathering, local jobs and working places. And these areas should also have the opportunity uh, for flexible use of buildings and public spaces as well. And many of our cities um, actually do have neighborhoods that deliver this, but they tend to be in affluent or exclusive areas. And what we have to figure out is how to improve access to services in all neighborhoods, and certainly starting with the underserved. The second concept or tool that I wanna mention um, that really gets to the heart of what I was asked to talk about is actually a shift from transit-oriented development to transit-oriented communities. And I know it's just, it's a bit nuanced, but yet it's important, I think, as we approach our work. It's transforming development into communities. So conversely, transit-oriented development is a specific building or development project that is fundamentally shaped by its close proximity to transit. And with a transit-oriented community approach, the focus is about creating place, building community for people. And certainly no doubt that jobs and amenities are important, yet I believe that housing is fundamental in this development. Housing options and choices for a variety of income levels, including permanent supportive housing, is just so critical for us in, in our communities. And I believe that housing is just not about housing, but housing is about connecting our children to quality education. It's about bolstering local economies, it's about enabling healthy communities. And you've heard this theme before. It's really so that all of our residents can reach their full potential. In San Jose, we are preparing for the BART Silicon Valley phase two expansion through our downtown um, and an opportunity to equitably and sustainably organize growth around the new BART stations. The Valley Transportation Authority or VTA is managing this expansion and has embraced the transit oriented communities concept. The scale of growth and the investment um, in and around our BART stations is massive. And before BART arrives, we must advance our partnerships and we have to update plans and policies to ensure that the station areas become healthy and equitable and connected and prosperous transit oriented communities. VTA has actually established playbooks for the new downtown San Jose station and the 28th Street Little Portugal station. The playbooks present a starting point for really what's going to be a long-term partnership between the community, the city, and the VTA to capitalize on the transit investments and to build our communities. And for downtown, the arrival of BART 
can certainly help to further reposition our downtown as a new place of prominence in the Bay Area. The total market potential we see right now in downtown San Jose is about 24 million square feet. However, the existing development potential or capacity that's in our current general plan is only 12 million. So certainly we must take the limits off in that area. And for the neighborhood 28th Street Little Portugal Station, the focus is on more affordable housing, funding tools, and bicycle, pedestrian, and transit connections that ensure good access for neighborhoods that's around the station area. And the community has made it absolutely clear to us that um, very foundationally that any new development uh, and any plans and any policy really has to reflect the history and the heritage of the Latino and Portuguese uh, heritage that currently exists in the area. So it's about preserving that richness and promoting its importance. Now I wanna take the time to share an exciting example in San Jose of station area planning and the experience of having a major private sector partner to implement um, our vision. And that is Google's Downtown Wex mixed use development project that is located in the Deardon station of our downtown. So it's just west of our downtown area, only separated by, of course, a highway. Um, but this is our opportunity to really um, integrate our downtown and really see, realize uh, the strength of the area. Just two weeks ago, our city council approved the mixed use development project, the development agreement, as well as the amended Deridon Station Area Plan and an associated Deridon Affordable Housing Implementation Plan. And so obviously this was a huge milestone for city staff, for our community, for the Google team, and really was the culmination of years of hard work, engagement, and negotiation. The Deardon Station Transit Center is located along the Union Pacific, Caltrain, Amtrak, ACE Community Express train right-of-way. With the addition of BART and the planned California high-speed rail service, the Transit Center, which is already a major transit hub, will certainly emerge as one of the premier multimodal stations in California and honestly, the largest transit hub west of the Mississippi River. I wanna share with you what it means to have a private sector partner who actually gets it. So what Google brought to the table, it really was a call to action, rethinking how to build and grow cities together. They focused on reimagining how this part of downtown could represent the values and the creativity that is uniquely San Jose. Complete neighborhoods within 15 minutes was central in the design approach. Also a smarter, greener way forward was key. Zero net new CO2 emissions and a proposal for an advanced microgrid electrical distribution system to be constructed and funded by Google. The project and the planning has been an absolute evolution, building from over a decade of engagement that led to co-creation. And it was actually back in 2009 that a Good Neighbor Committee was first formed to develop the aspirations and the guiding principles for the Deridon Station area. Um, and the original plan uh, was actually planning for a new ballpark and a major league baseball team. And well, obviously that didn't pan out. Uh, it was really in 2016 when Google first approached the city about its ideas uh, developing um, at the station and sharing their desire to not just bring a bunch of jobs and jobs that we really did want um, in the downtown, but really to create a dynamic urban district. 
In early 2018, the city council established the station area advisory group to guide the entire process. And this group, you know, 40 plus people um, that met nearly 20 times. Um, and then a major milestone was in December 2018 when the city and Google executed the Memorandum of Understanding that outlined the shared goals. And the city council direction on the top three community benefit priorities were affordable housing, anti-displacement, and education job opportunities. In 2019, we continued extensive engagement and design workshops. Um, there were city-sponsored meetings, like over 30 meetings hosted by the city. Google actually hosted their own events. There were pop-up events and workshops. Um, the city actually contracted with seven community-based organizations. Um, to reach those in neighborhoods that it's difficult sometimes for city staff to reach. Um, these were organizations um, who had deep ties in the neighborhoods, residents trust them. These organizations were already de delivering key services to these residents. So we saw this as a, a tremendous vehicle to reach people and to get other voices into the conversation. And also at this time and into 2020, the staff analysis really kicked into high gear. So tremendous work on the rezoning, on developing the design standards and guidelines, uh, and perhaps probably the toughest job was preparing the environmental impact report for the project. And of course, in 2020, we all had to pivot to digital engagement, staff working remotely. It's what I think back on this, it's almost amazing that we were able to accomplish so much during a pandemic, um, but we did it. So the engagement continued. Um, we did the virtual meetings. We uh, did informational videos. And earlier this year, the development agreement began to be crafted including the community benefits and the governance structure. And this is where, um, you know, I have to say I'm really proud of city government um, because we really began to lean into co-creation. And co-creation is really all about shared power and shared responsibility. So the city, we had to understand there was gonna be some power we were gonna to have to give up. We were gonna to have to share it with our community members, with our equity advocates, with people who are living in our neighborhoods and being impacted. And that was just an amazing experience. Um, you know, I will say, I definitely have to acknowledge that um, we got off to a very rocky start. There was a lot of distrust, rightfully so, um, in our communities, among our residents. Um, people protested. There was a lot of fear about displacement and that the development would be exclusive and walled off and not be a part of our downtown and our community. Um, we actually had members of the public who chained themselves to their seats during a city council um, meeting uh, in the chambers. So it, it was not rosy by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it took commitment. Uh, it took courage. It took seeing ourselves differently. It took really, really deep listening. Um, and yes, there were a lot of tough meetings and discussions. And honestly, it took a lot of staff resources as, as well. Um, it was a total, total team effort and nearly 100 city staff worked on the project um, at some point. And, and people from so many different departments from planning and economic development and housing and parks and recreation and public works and transportation, environmental services, community energy, of course, our city attorney's office. So just a total, total team effort. 
So what's the development program? What are we looking forward to with Google's um, mixed use development? So we are looking forward to 7.3 million square feet of office space, 4,000 housing units. And I'm so excited to share that we reach our goal of 25% affordable housing. So 1,000 affordable housing units and Google is actually delivering land early to the city so that we can start construction on these affordable units very soon. It also includes a half million square feet of active uses, which includes retail and cultural space and arts and education. And then 15 acres of parks and plazas and green spaces. So we will realize 80 acres of detailed design over time. Google is in this for the long haul. It's, it's great to have a partner like them. Uh, and so they're going to be with us. Um, the, the program includes over 30 buildings with 10 different parks, three miles of street improvements. And we know that um, the phase development will happen um, over 10 years plus. So going back to the community benefits, which totaled uh, $200 million for our community. And this really is a first of its kind model for addressing social equity. It's community-led decision-making on the distribution of the community stabilization and opportunity funds. Now these are distributed as grants to programs and services that address displacement and homelessness, stabilization of our small businesses, occupational skills training, scholarships for students, early childhood education, and entrepreneurial support. So through sustained funding, stewardship, and partnership, Google's Downtown West Mixed Use Development Project is building an ecosystem for success over the long haul. So a key point here is that early intervention and transit oriented communities is absolutely key. We can't wait until after a project is approved to start thinking about incorporating social equity and, and implementing those strategies. It's just simply too late. Um, and in the city of San Jose, thankfully, we were just fortunate enough to build upon our existing station area plan. We were fortunate to really have a strong partner committed to community. As I close, I want to acknowledge that our city building and our community building work is extremely complicated. It is taxing and it is trying. We know that we're gonna have to take risks. We will sometimes make mistakes, which is okay, we'll learn from them. And we know that oftentimes the process gets messy. But remember the results are good outcomes for people and our environment. So I want to leave you with this brief inspirational message that I, I read it last June. It was during a really hard time. I was just having a hard time at work personally. And here's the message. What makes an action courageous? Courage isn't just acting boldly. It's acting boldly for a greater purpose, for something larger than yourself. To be courageous, you need to have a worthy mission. I encourage you today to take the limits off and determine what your worthy mission will be for our communities. Thank you for your time today and for the opportunity to share with you. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Um, wow, you really covered a ton of ground there. Um, various lenses through which you look at the role of planning in for the future and what the city of San Jose is doing to challenge the systemic issues is incredibly compelling. I know that our viewers will have a lot of questions for you and for the upcoming panel, but that you have an eighth grade graduation to get to. So thank you again so much for your time. Um, we really wanna thank you and uh, for elevating the issues of equity and moving us all toward the conversation of transit oriented communities. And now I want to welcome Sheba Ross, 
principal in our urban design studio and moderator for our panel to join us. Hi, Sheba. Good to see you. Hey, Kate. Uh, you're right, and it's pretty amazing to hear about this shift in thinking between transit-oriented development uh, to transit-oriented communities. And I think one of the key lessons we learned from Rosalind today is what happens when we think of ROI, not just in terms of economics, but in terms of people and investment in order to get back, you have to invest meaningfully. So thank you so much for hosting that conversation. And um, just to kind of keep this uh, dialogue going, I'd love to hear from the audience. Audience, if you can go ahead, get into your chat mode and uh, let us know what is one word you would use to describe the city you are tuning in from today. So um, go ahead, put that on chat um, and just use one word, okay? One word to go ahead and tell me, where do you live right now? Where are you working from? Where are you tuning in? And what you see as these words come flooding through, I'm hoping that everyone is seeing these words, you know, from mixing pot to sunny, sprawling, rural, complicated, horizontal vertigo. You see that traditionally when we've looked at TODs, they're typically defined in terms of ridership, density, connection, use mix, movement, flexibility. But as I see these words coming up on my screen, I wanna bring us home to this word of identity. You know, identity has such a close connection to social equity. And because that's our conversation today, it is my absolute honor to welcome our multidisciplinary panel. Panelists, if you can go ahead and turn on your videos so that we can get to see you. I am so pleased to present to you Shuprathim Bamek, who is a partner with HRNA Advisors. We have Rachel Flynn from Fairfax County. She's a deputy county ex executive. We have Carla Mays, who is one of the co-founders of the Smart Cohort. And we have Debbie Frank, the director of Transit Oriented Developments at MARTA, and I'm from Atlanta, so it's just such a pleasure to have her uh, join this group. You see that we have multiple geographies represented here, correct? We have Georgia, we have Virginia, New York, California, but their impact has been global. And our panelists actually represent a spectrum of partnerships at both the public and private sectors. So with that, if we can actually stop the screen sharing and get to see our panelists up front, we are gonna get started with a rapid fire round. You know, that's the way these panels have to go in order to get engagement. So what I would love for each of our panelists to share in this rapid fire round is to share the two angles of interest and engagement that you have in transit oriented developments, your professional background that is stirring an interest, but also your personal investments. And let's go ahead and start with Tripratham. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you again, um, uh, the HKS team for, for, um, for inviting me and, and um, all the other panelists. So again, my name is Shupratim Bamek. I'm a partner at HRN Advisors. Um, I come from a public sector background and my practice is really at the intersection of economic development strategy and public-private partnerships. Transit-oriented development or transit-oriented communities, I find that actually a, a, a more interesting word, something which I'm gonna use from now on, is really one of the manifestations where I bring my practice together in terms of uh, how do I sort of use economic development strategy? How do I use real estate? How do I use, how do I use public-private partnerships to, to make impact on the ground? Um, so that's the first part, that's my professional sort of practice. I think personally, it's sort of interesting, you know, uh, the. The notion of transit-oriented communities or transit-oriented development is a new one, right? It has existed over hundreds of years. If you go back to the colonial times in Africa, in Asia, where I was sort of born and brought up in India, you know, railroad communities were set up purely as a means of economic extraction. So to think about sort of the, the inequities that are inherent in transit planning 
and think about how we bring about equity, both from a social perspective, from a land use perspective, from an access perspective is really something which motivates my sort of transit work um, uh, here and in the rest of the world. So really happy again uh, to be part of this discussion with, with all my panelists. Yeah, welcome, Shupratim. Um, Carla, let's hear more from you. Greetings and thank you so much for having me. Um, from my background is, you know, coming to it from a public sector background um, in policy, looking at policies, um, looking at, you know, ground truthing what's going on in the communities. How do they interact? And then into the smart city looking at equitable, smart, and disaster resilient cities. If we've done our job right, um, then, you know, cities should be able to be, you should be able to have ease and navigate them well. My challenge has been, is, you know, not only being a professional of color in, the, in, in, in being able to be recognized for what you bring to the table, but to be on projects so that they're informed at the governance and finance level of a project where social equity really is. We express our values through money, um, especially in the Western world and, in, and especially in the United States where legislation is what the legislation governs how much money gets spent and things of that nature. And so I come to it on that level, then working with public leaders um, and, and working with communities and ground truthing that, and then being able to advise on project on the, at the governance and finance level. Um, and then with SMART cohort, we work with public officials to understand SMART systems and what those SMART systems as we in, interact with them and we buy more of them to be able to manage more transportation and what are the fallacies? What are some of the narratives that get told, but then on the community level, no one asks them, how do they commute? How does this affect them? How do they afford it? Um, does this really work? And so we you know, do a lot of work at, at really looking at that and then working with professionals, engineering and logistics firms on being able to go after these kind of projects, but being able to create a team that is, is local and diverse, and then being able to leverage that with global understanding of these projects from Asia and other places, particularly Singapore building for the multicultural society. Sure, and we're gonna hear more about that in a bit. So I'd um, love to hear from Rachel. Rachel, what are the two angles that you are bringing today? Thanks, Shiva. So I started my um, career as an architect, actually. I was in the private sector and did that for 12 years, but I was really interested in the bigger picture and not just one building at a time. So I went back to school and when I graduated, um, I became a planning and building director uh, in Virginia. First city was Lynchburg, terrible name, but it was a great city. And um, we got a lot done. They had a beautiful downtown that really just needed some attention and TLC, which we provided very rewarding to see all boats rise when through good design and good public policy. And then from there went on to Richmond and then Abu Dhabi, because that's where you go after Richmond. That's a long story. And then ended up in Oakland. And Oakland was really my foray into genuine discussions about equity, inclusion, diversity. Um, this, the residents insisted on it. They, they weren't gonna take no for an answer. It was the first time I had seen a public meeting shut down where people chain themselves to the dais and they meant business. And we really needed to uh, self-evaluate and figure out how to help people um, where, where they could also benefit. If you would show them a beautiful rendering of a place, they'd say, well, I'll never live there. And so we really had to have a serious discussion on how, how do we change that? And then interestingly, the reason I know Rosalind um, is I then went to Google and was uh, an executive there for, uh, for the planning uh, division. And we worked on San Jose, among other places like Mountain View. And the same thing happened. Our first public meeting uh, at Google uh, was shut down as Rosalind was speaking about. And I must hand it to Google that they, they too, um, like the city of Oakland and the city of San Jose became very serious about this issue. They gave a billion dollars to the region for affordable housing. 
And these were tough decisions. It wasn't just made overnight. They made serious decisions about the community benefits they gave to that project, affordable housing, whatnot. And so uh, long story short, but I ended up back in Virginia. And um, what I love about um, what I'm doing now is it's not just planning. So as deputy county executive, I'm planning transportation, public works, economic development, whatnot. But it's that three-legged stool of you can't look at planning without looking at transportation. You can't look at economic development without looking at planning. And they all link. And I think we've siloed them. And they all go get back to equity. Who benefits from good design, good transportation? Where are jobs created? So the, that's what I'm focusing on right now. Thank you so much, Rachel. And um, that brings me to my neighbor, uh, Debbie Frank. I would love to hear what you are looking at personally and professionally in terms of TODs. Sure, great. Thank you and good afternoon, um, Shiva and everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Today, I am Debbie Frank, Director of Transit-Oriented Development within the Office of TOD and Real Estate at MARTA in Atlanta. And in this role, I oversee the planning and implementation of the Authority's TOD program around um, rail stations, and future bus rapid transit stations. We are, are gearing up for the possibility of two lines here in the city. Um, we currently have around 400 acres of redevelopment opportunity for mixed use communities. And this includes opportunities at some of our existing bus and rail maintenance facility. So just a little bit about MARTA. We are the 12th largest transit system in the US. We have 38 rail stations along 48 miles of rail. We have a little over 100 bus routes and pre-pandemic, our daily ridership was um, 450,000 passengers a day. So we were really pleased with that. We're hoping to get back to that number here pretty soon. Um, we have several expansion projects within our current um, system. And like most transit agencies across the country, we need to secure additional funding to implement these projects, um, which we, we will leverage as the Office of TOD um, to facilitate more mixed-use transit-oriented communities that we know for those in this industry is a catalyst for ec um, equitable development. So for me, prior to joining MARTA just over five years ago, I was involved in planning and real estate development in emerging markets in Nashville, Tennessee, within the, both the private and nonprofit sectors. Um, I did do volunteer work around transit as a board member of the Regional Transportation Authority. And I did do some work around, volunteer work around equitable development as a board member of the Housing Club. It's a CDFI supporting affordable residential and commercial development as well as home ownership in Nashville at that time. And now the program is having an impact across the state of Tennessee. So again, I look forward to the panel discussion around social equity and transit oriented development. Yeah, and while I have you on our speaker view, I think it'll be great to kick off the heart of our conversation with a question to you, uh, Debbie, like what we are talking about today is how can social equity be fueled by transit-oriented developments? And uh, we would um, like to hear from you. So where are these gaps? And how can policy, planning, and programming actually set the stage for equitable development? I uh, would like to hear your thoughts on that. OK. And so um, can we see the slides that I provided? Perfect. And we can just move to the first one here. So for MARTA, when you think of MARTA's transit rail system, it is really easy to think of the transit rail infrastructure as lines and the stations and the community development that's occurring around the stations as the dots. So within the office of TOD, this graphic really illustrates our compass and serves as the filter from which we do our work. We want to connect people to housing, food, um, jobs, healthcare, entertainment, schools, you name it. And, and which for us makes for more equitable, livable communities for everyone. So that's first and foremost. Um, next slide, I just wanna share a little bit about um, our TOD program, which is directed by our, our TOD guidelines and policy. So we are charged with leveraging and protecting MARTA's real estate assets in order to increase ridership, generate a return on the initial investment that created the system, um, support community development and regional economic development. 
in an equitable way for all of Metro Atlanta. MARTA, we do not pay property taxes. However, once TOD projects are under construction by our development partners, MARTA property is then placed on the tax roll. So giving our local municipalities additional resources to provide uh, city and county services. Um, for instance, just from mid uh, 2017, just to just last year, we had three TOD projects that generated a little over $3 million in city and county property taxes. And that would not have been realized if not for our transit oriented developments. Next slide, please. Since the adoption of our TOD guidelines and policies in 2010 and the creation of the Office of TOD in 2013, MARTA's TOD program has stayed true to creating uh, mixed-use communities. We have a 20% affordable housing goal for all TODs with a residential component. And this is for individuals earning anywhere from 60 to 80% of the area median income. And in Metro Atlanta, that's just over a little over $82,000. $82, um, we currently have 18 TODs in various stages of development. Um, and we are positioned to continue to play an important role in Metro Atlanta in the areas of affordable housing, community redevelopment, economic development, and, and just examining our impact of, of, of afford, in, in the area of affordable housing. Since 2010, MARTA has completed 114 affordable housing units. We have 153 units that are currently under construction. We anticipate 600 new affordable housing units coming online from a little over half a dozen projects that we have since um, awarded. We're currently in negotiations with our development partner and these uh, new units will include senior housing. Um, with MARTA's board approval to solicit proposals for transit oriented development at eight stations and seven of those stations are on our south and west lines. We have the potential to create nearly 1,100 new affordable housing units for families and seniors. The seven stations on the south side of West Rail Lines are in the opportunity zones, and the goal is for us to have actually 30% of the units affordable for people earning 80 to 20% of the area median household income which in some cases are just over $25,000. So we want to make sure people who are living around our stations can, if they so desire, live in these new transit-oriented communities we are creating. So MARTA currently have, has 18 um, TOD projects and are estimated to introduce nearly 2,000 new affordable housing units in Metro Atlanta. And lastly, I would just like to share, in addition to our affordable housing, MARTA has other social equity um, initiatives like the Fresh MARTA Market. It's a program to provide fresh produce at stations in food deserts. We are in our sixth year of the program and currently have five locations along our south and west um, rail lines. We have served over 120,000 customers since the start of the program. And, and this program was a critical food access point during the pandemic. Um, so we were really pleased to be able to play that role in the community. And also I, I would like to share that we have a station soccer program where a um, local nonprofit called Soccer in the Streets is introducing the game of soccer and life skills to kids who fight with financial circumstances would not allow this opportunity. And by locating the many pitches at or near rail stations, the burden of access to the soccer program is eliminated. We currently have four of the planned 10 soccer mini pitch fields completed at three MARTA stations and one location um, just across from a MARTA station. And we hope to bring online an additional two stations um, this year. So just a little bit about what we're doing and look forward to the discussion a little later on. Sure, Debbie, and uh, the key point is really when you talked about the lines and the dots, right? The idea that we think about, when we think about transit, we think a lot about the lines, but life happens at the dots. And what MARTA is doing is that it's looking at the body, mind, and soul, which is really why we wanted you to share that uh, perspective uh, today. But uh, so let's actually dwell a little bit on this idea. 
for a development to be transit oriented, it has to be human centered. Uh, and if I'm right, like that's kind of the message that we heard from Debbie, but I'll be curious to hear from Rachel next. Rachel, with what you have been doing, again, we're still in the public sector realm. Um, if you can talk about the fact that maybe T is not just about the trains, but that it also has this human aspect to it. Thanks, Shiva. Are they sharing slides? Yes. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so here are three TODs in Fairfax County. I don't know how much the audience knows about Fairfax County, but Tyson's Corner, which we now call Tyson's, is on the left, um, an area called Mosaic District, pretty new, about 10 years old, on an old drive-in theater in the middle, and then Reston, which I would think most people on the call, particularly the planners, know about this going back to the 1960s. Next slide. So here's a map of, um, of Fairfax, because we all need to see a map and orient, orient ourselves. So there, there are a couple of things you, you need to know about uh, Fairfax. It's really big. It's 400 square miles, and it's 1.2 million people. We're bigger than eight states and the District of Columbia. So dealing with that, uh, like we're, we're a small country, <laughs> it's really challenging to get the right transit in the right places to help everybody. So when we formed back in the day, um, it, we were just a bedroom community. It was farms and forests. And then with the creation of the automobile, we just became a big um, bedroom community. Next slide, please. And we were very focused on uh, the automobile, as you can see here. So that's Tyson's on the left. Country roads are gone. They've now become arterials. So we had the, the shopping centers, the malls, the office parks and the subdivisions, and nothing was walkable. And what was wrong with that? And you didn't need to create place. And how was this going to affect um, all people, particularly people who couldn't afford a car or had other ways of living? So remember, it was mostly white people who came out here because they could afford it. Uh, there was some redlining, and a lot of people stayed uh, in the center cities, uh, particularly DC. Uh, next slide. And all that changed with Metro. So here's where the T does matter uh, to Shiva's er earlier point. Um, and you could see, let's see, you see the White House there. I think everyone knows the White House. So that's in the center where you see four lines crossing each other. But Fairfax is off to the left. And you get through, you go through uh, Arlington and Alexandria, and then you get to Fairfax. And um, next slide, please. What, what you can see and what that did for us is it, uh, got us, it started to get us out of our cars. We're not completely out of them, but it started to create that real sense of place. Whereas before it was just, again, getting around by car. And, and that uh, put people in certain categories and certainly addressed equity. Now we're creating these public spaces that we never really had before. We had ball fields and that kind of thing, but not these kind of urban parks where everyone was uh, included and invited and where a lot of people wanna be now, this is the kind of lifestyle they want. And new street designs, like the one on the lower right, where you can actually jaywalk and it's not a problem. The speeds are slow, they're beautiful places. Um, next slide, please. As opposed to this, uh, this is what we've had, 10 lanes, uh, because we have a system, we don't control our roads actually, it's the state. And that's something we're addressing. And we're trying to bring to the state's attention that it's not just about vehicle throughput because this does harm to our economy, to our people, to creating place, to creating beauty and safety. Um, and by changing their formulas, they use what's called LOS, level of service. We call it level of stupidity. So we're trying to get them to switch that. Next slide, please. So one of the places um, is in the lower right where we have um, uh, what we call Richmond Highway or Route 1. This was a, goes back to colonial times, uh, this route, uh, uh, Mount Vernon is in the lower right, just to orient you, and that's the Potomac River. Um, and you see here um, at the top, there's a metro stop, and that's on the border of Alexandria. But as you come down, this is one of our poorest corridors and they don't have Metro. Metro went to the West, as you can see in the very top there, you see the M. 
Um, and so we're putting in BRT and where, where you see those red dots, that's where a station's gonna be. And that's where we're gonna build the little villages, if you will, along route one and really uh, create that place that we've um, been talking about um, so that all, all boats can rise. And we want to ensure that gentrification doesn't happen, that people don't kick, get kicked out. So the county is investing a lot of money in affordable housing in strategic locations. So we have three on this corridor alone. We have them in Tyson's, we have them in Reston. Uh, there's scattered site affordable housing and the, our board is very serious about this issue. Uh, next slide, please. And with this, we uh, will create great spaces so you don't just have the strip mall and all people can enjoy good streets, good public spaces, economic prosperity, and you don't get left behind. Uh, next slide. But today, this is what it looks like. And it's often where the poor live or, or lower middle class than poor, and they deserve better. Next slide. We know that they're disproportionately affected um, uh, with pedestrian deaths, cyclist deaths, and this isn't okay. We, we need to start humanizing our streets and TODs play a really critical part of that. That's where people want to be. No one walks the street like this, crosses it because they want to. It's just, they don't really have a choice. And this is what we've given them um, uh, uh, as public sector. We, we need to do better. Next slide, please. They're disproportionate. We know that people of color, the elderly, um, and um, uh, lower income people are disproportionately affected, particularly in pedestrian deaths. Um, a lot of them walk more because they have to. And they're also in places like those slides I showed you before where the street is just not built for them. And so it's a really good time right now. Um, so much attention is being given to this issue from Biden to Buttigieg to our governors um, who are, are really rethinking transportation. It's a great time to be in this business to say that through good quality street design, slowing the speed, humanizing the streets, creating great places, getting people to transit in not just a safe way, but a beautiful way so that they enjoy these places and everybody deserves that beauty. Next. So I'll leave you with this uh, slide. This, was, this is one of our success stories, Mosaic, the one that was built on the old drive-in theater. It's about a half mile from Metro. This public space, as you can see, it's always being used. Uh, people are dying for quality space with the great uses all around it. Notice how the streets are well designed. The architecture is appropriately scaled. It's got arts and culture. So I will leave you with this image of Fairfax, where how we want our whole county to look. Thank you. That is interesting, Rachel. What you shared actually reminds me about these conversations that we typically have about equality versus equity, right? And this idea that uh, one size cannot fit all, that everything that we talk about in terms of transit-oriented communities is contextually driven, is generationally driven. We have to understand what uh, data we are dealing with. And, and so I'd like to actually welcome uh, Shupratim to this conversation, just with what you've done in initially with the public sector, but your involvement with market analysis and also your global experience, Shupratim, like um, tell us more about why one size cannot fit all. That's, that's a great question, Shiva. And, and, um, and so, you know, before, before I start sort of addressing the question, I want to just tell Rachel that sort of um, the Mosaic District looks amazing and I'm really excited to be actually visiting it on Sunday, on Saturday evening for dinner with some friends who live- uh, Fantastic, who live, contributing who, to our tax base. Exactly, exactly. Right. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but, but back to the question at hand, um, you know, as sort of urbanists sort of, you know, we have been working with, um, you know, with urban planners and designers and architects such as yourselves, um, with the transportation engineers, and more and more with sort of community groups and affordable housing advocates to really come up with what we are calling, you know, an, an equitable TOD framework. And, and the way we approach this is through these sort of four different lenses, if you will, you know, identifying who is impacted by transit, um, and how they're impacted, engagement, 
um, with the communities that are likely to be impacted and understanding sort of what their goals are, um, evaluating um, what their equity, equity criteria are. And this goes directly, Sheba, to, to your um, question about not a one size fits all because communities are different in terms of other existing conditions and, and the, their desires and goals. Um, and then how do we implement this? What are the policy tools that sort of, you know, both local governments, transit agencies, but also more and more community organizations need to coordinate to sort of really implement um, implement some of these, some of these equitable TOD uh, I, I, I ideas. And I think the common theme that is sort of running through all of this, all these four lenses, is really about, um, you know, this is not a, this is not the equity lens, is not a top-down process. It's not an add-on process, but it's really sort of um, part and parcel of the way we think about transitory development and, and communities around sort of our transit stations. Um, next slide. Um, We've sort of taken, uh, done some deep thinking in terms of thinking about, well, uh, we understand generally speaking what is equitable TOD, but how does it really differ from traditional TOD? Um, not just somewhat from a definitional perspective, but in terms of how we as sort of urbanists and planners actually do the work that needs to get done. And, and the way we thought of, we think about this is really starting from all the way from demographic and market analysis, all the way down to joint development. And I won't spend any time sort of talking through each of these things, but suffice to say sort of, you know, working to create sort of the equitable TOD framework and rally where we've been working for the past couple of years. And I know, um, um, Rosalind has, has left the meeting, but um, we have been working since 2016 with the city of San Jose, assisting them on sort of negotiating this big community benefits agreement with Google, where in addition to everything else, um, you know, Google committed to $200 million um, as part of a community benefit action plan. Um, so we have kind of developed these sort of tools to understand when we approach an equitable TOD and, you know, by definition, you know, we are looking at all our TODs as equitable TODs. How are the, how are the, how, what are the things that we need to do differently um, through these various processes and steps um, than what we would have traditionally done in, in the past. And again, to, just to give you a simple example, you know, take demographic or market analysis in the past, we would have looked at demographic conditions and looked at, you know, in a community, we would have defined a community and we would have said, you know, here's the average income or here's the median household income, completely papering over the fact that sort of, you know, what is, are there any differences across racial differences? Are there any historic differences? And what does that mean in terms of a strategy that we are coming up with for, for this, for this transit-oriented development? Next slide. You know, it's, it's cliche to say that sort of, um, you know, you are what you measure, but uh, more and more it's becoming really important. I think Rosalind mentioned this. Um, you know, in terms of we've had enough about thinking about process, we also need to think about outcomes. Um, so thinking about what are some of these new definitions of success about TOD and how are they sort of different from our traditional definition. So like, you know, typically in a traditional approach, you know, we would have we would have looked at sort of market growth. We would have looked at overall mobility and access. We would have counted increase in tried to you know, private transit leader ridership or an increase in sort of how much of private investment was being levered by public capital. But in an equity approach, we are looking at things very differently. We are defining success in terms of access to capital. We are defining success in terms of property ownership among legacy populations. We are bringing in a very community-based lens to think about those successes. Um, the next slide also sort of lays out um, you know some of the some of the ways in which we are defining success differently in and sort of you know in a, in an equitable TOD context than a traditional TOD context, and so all of all of which goes to say, and again, um, 
you know, the, the real sort of emphasis um, and focus that we see in social equity and inclusion has been happening, and that's a fantastic development in the last four or five years, we are going to see these outcomes, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. So a key piece of the process is really going back to some of the places we have all worked together on and understanding, you know, what are some of the lessons we are go we're going to learn from those places. It's quite clear that some of the policies and some of the processes that we've laid out will need to be tweaked. We'll learn by trial and error. So it's really important to set some success factors right up front so we can go back and really sort of score and judge ourselves in terms of how well have we achieved some of these measures that we have laid out at the beginning of the process. And then finally, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, if you go to the next slide, I do uh, a lot of work internationally. Um, you know, most of the work um, is either for sovereign governments or transit agencies or for, you know, multilateral institutions like the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and the IS, um, IFC. And, and the work is, this is just sort of a snapshot of stuff. The work is at different scales. Um, and, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time. I'm happy to answer more during Q&A. It could be something which is like, you know, very specific, like the Salandia work in Brazil, where we are looking at sort of a, 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 a a suburban area outside Brasilia, um, low income, low density, and thinking through, you know, what, what needs to be done. There's an existing sort of commuter rail line. What needs to be done to create more density and social equity over there, as opposed to something like the electric train in San Jose, which is, you know, a 40 kilometer east-west alignment where we think 18 stations, where we're thinking about it from a more holistic sort of, you know, um, system-wide perspective. And again, and also obviously, um, you know, different types of transit sort of uh, transit interventions from, from, you know, heavy rail to light rail to streetcars and buses and so on and so forth. So happy to answer more of those questions, um, uh, uh, you know, but, but want to turn it back to Shiva and the, and the other panelists. Thank you, Shupratham. So um, in just listening to that, you actually laid out a mosaic of uh, possibilities, Rachel, no pun intended, but that's the word that came to my mind as uh, Shipratham was talking about all these different facets that actually in, um, define transit-oriented development. Sometimes we just think of it as a singular platform, but really a very strong foundation requires all these different players. So uh, that actually brings me to a question that I would um, pose to Carla. Yeah, just through the last few minutes, we talked a lot about the what and the who, you know, the where, and uh, I'd like to get to the heart of the why. And uh, one of the best ways the why can be answered is when we look at uh, research, we look at innovation, but also looking back at what history has taught us. So uh, Carla, the floor is yours. I know that you're doing a lot in that space. Yes. So um, I, you know, just hearing everybody, you know, we're, we've talked about these projects in America and like, you know, where, you know, where we like what we don't like and then what we are, we're aspiring to be. And then there's, there's where we are. And then it's looking at where we are in compared to what's the best practice. And so, you know, when you look at, you go to Singapore, and I remember my first, you know, my first trip to Singapore, um, and, and just being able to be, you know, um, I, I want to make sure I've got, I've got the slides up, so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm honoring the time here. So kind of just jumping straight into this, you know, where are we right now? We're talking about you know, the sustainable development goals, we're talking about meeting the, the resiliency. And then we're talking about being in the United States where equity is a huge issue on, you know, um, we often say here in the Bay Area, Whole Foods shopping, Prius, you know, Prius driving or Tesla's driving, right? Um, it Smart Cohort was started six years ago at, when I was at NASA Ames Sing and Singularity, um, you know, when I was chosen as a fellow um, in their impact, impact um, global impact cohort. And we, we began my, you know, David, David Capelli and myself began, uh, met at the, in San Jose. So we're, we're very, uh, have a lot of love for San Jose um, at the Global, uh, Global Innovation Summit by T2 Ventures in the UAE. 
government. And we were very fortunate to be there as a cohort of 300 folks, being able to be asked, like, what is the next generation of this work? And how is this, the smart city going to improve social equity and, and economic and workforce development? And we began, you know, at the beginning with, with when these goals were introduced. And we started looking at taking on number 10, 11, uh, 13, and 17. And the reason why was we were going to have to do this in partnership. We were going to have to bring in new voices and we were going to have to work with the, the emerging tech sector in, in this, um, along with heavy, you know, along with a lot of our transportation that is behind Asia. So we already knew that we were going to have to focus on understanding more about Asia, more about uh, transit-oriented developments in housing and the, the role of technology. Next slide. So these are the, these are the challenges that we, we deal with right now. We, we have seen coming out of this pandemic that our transit agencies failed. They failed, they, they weren't for essential ridership the European model of something that we want to aspire to is not that Asian model I was just talking to. And we deal with a lot of crime, um, a lot of crime, a lot of homelessness, a lot of challenges. And then we don't have cohesion at our federal, state, and local levels to fund and to be able to get that done. That, that it means that we have a lot of one, we have a lot of one-time funding, like what we have coming up with um, our, our, you know, funds that we're looking, you know, looking at with President Biden um, and, you know, unfunded mandates. And that presents a problem in us being able to really deliver on, on social equity because it's normally this funding at the high legislation, the legislative or governance levels that enact the, what we're going to be able to do on the ground and how that's going to be able to carry out. Our eroding relationship with China and other Asian countries, that is really going to impact the way we're going to be able to develop these um, new, using the new technologies, understanding transit oriented developments and things of that nature. And then ITS systems are playing a huge part in the way transit is developed. Transit is, is the day-to-day -day interactions that folks are having with transit. Do they want to ride? Is, is the expense of spending so much money on ITS really what what we should be doing or is it should we be you know looking at things of access you know free transit equity these are the equity issues and the utility and that's where we be able to get this going so these are the these are some of the things that we've enacted we don't we necessarily put a narrative together about these things and that they're good things but we don't necessarily ground truth next next slide next slide so this is where the, the money in Build Back Better. And I just wanna, you know, these, these are the things that the money that we're currently working with right now. And like I said, governance level on this is very important because it goes to what we're going to be able to build, how the operation and maintenance, and then how these projects are going, how what we're going to be able to interact, who's going to be on the team and, and so on and so forth. Next slide. So, Getting back to the essence of this, if you it, so in uh, in in the 1980s, this is where we really got our love for Europe, right? The, the the very best of the best. We brought Siemens, you know, to California in Sacramento under um, under former mayor and governor uh, Pete Wilson. We had the California German bilateral exchange that still exists to this day, now focused on clean energy, and it's it's about more than just you know the 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 the, um, the the environment or just looking at where the the places of the stations it really goes back to the trains how they're developed or the buses uh with patera here in the bay area is making electric buses all of these are jobs in and this is the way our community kind of moves forward is the whole the whole um built environment on being able to have a transit oriented development next slide so david and i and our team at smart cohort has been deeply involved in understanding equity 
and understanding these uh, public private partnerships, the federal funding that where those partnerships come, and then who is a, a allowed to be on project, which then goes into the development. As you can see here, Dave, David and I and our team were able to bring um, transportation camps. So if you've ever been uh, involved in transportation camp, we've had the fortune of being uh, involved with most, I, most of the, I would say probably eight to 10 year history of it, and then have the honor of hosting um, the one in Florida where we focused on a uh, disaster. We're seeing more climate issues, and that 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 goes to transportation. It also goes to how we're able to put folks on project, and then how we're able to build out these projects. So we um, have been very, you know, uh, very um, excited to be able to be a part of these processes and be able to see the different elements on how you bring teams together to be able to deliver these projects, how these jobs, you know, what jobs are, and then how that goes to the design. And then how do we um, in, end up impacting neighborhoods and communities is by having the university partnerships, the community partnerships, and, and also looking at who the develop the, the folks are. So from organizations like NSBE and others, um, you're, you're able to get those students, you're able to be able to understand um, through the minority airports and ports and other types of organizations, bringing all those folks together, understanding what those projects are and how to deliver on them for the community. Next slide. So when you have success, like we were, I was showing in the last slide, you then can build on that success to be able to have greater success in building these projects, bringing the right kind of funding, and then being able to have the right O&M and re retain that, those folks to be able to be on the next project and to deliver the next project where you actually have, it's local, it's folks that, that are local, you have less litigation, less opposition to projects, you have the O&M, um, the, the operations and maintenance, um, that is necessary. And you have those folks that have institutional memory. And then you also have what's very informed, informed practice that can be repeated over and over again. And you have that economic development that is it, that continues to cycle. Because that's the one thing that um, in our projects, we normally, you know, bring a design team in that maybe not understand the community. There's a lot of uh, lost time and things as they try to figure it out. Um, and so with this process of really working, you know, being able to work on these things, you're, you work on the, the project, you're able to deliver it. And you're able to have that informed practice, which leads into more, you have that funding mechanisms so you don't have unfunded parts of the project um you don't have parts of the project that they don't align and so next slide so i spoke about our trip to singapore it's very important to understand what is the very very best um at transit oriented developments and how those those projects like mrt in singapore as you're seeing here with david and i Hong Kong, mainland China, and Japan, and how these projects are birth to earth. And it's not the 15 minute city anymore, it's the centenarian city. How can some, how can a person that is in a wheelchair like the gentleman is there, or a, a person that is in their, their 90s or hundreds, be able to navigate the city without needing an aid, without you know, uh, needing you know, supports, and then be able to look at food food security, medical, education, and, you know, and all of those things being, you know, very easily to be accessible. And not, and, and, and not so much as to first start demonizing the car. In Singapore, they first got the transit right. And that's what's going to be very important is that we get the transit right, that we understand all levels of, of being able to deliver the project, being able to deliver it efficiently, and then being able to understand what what those those things what what it is that the community really needs and desires, and so ground truthing becomes something that David and I do a lot of, and our team does. We go to Asia, we go to uh, we go into various cities, and we really work with with the folks to understand who's doing what, where's the power structures and dynamics, where's the money. 
Um, how do you, how are you going to be able to bring these projects together? And then really understanding them. And, and as you do that, then we can build a cohort of people that then we actually learn together and then we're able to then go after. So next slide. So these are the things that, you know, really, really quickly, Singapore builds, it start, it starts off with a governance structure of multicultural community, a multicultural um, nation. And so if universal design is enacted, multicultural and folks can age in place and you're able to be able to see a TODs that are very dynamic, they're very close knit. And so it doesn't feel like you're just at a transit stop, but you're able to feeling that, that there's a community, the multicultural, uh, you know, aspects are all built in. So it's, it's not something that's separate or you feel like you're, you're in one area of the town uh, area or another, you feel it's really integrated. Next slide. So these are the things that, that, that we really have to focus on going forward. Talking about equitable smart cities, equitable transit stops, how these things integrate, understanding um, workforce and economic development, governance, and e, you know, ESG investments. That the, and understanding that investment portfolio is critical. And understanding great transit engineering. And so these are some of the points that, you know, I would love, love to engage you on um, deeper. These, these are things that we really have to, and, and, the, and I would highlight that our diplomacy with Asia is going to be very critical in us being able to understand this. Thank you very much. And next slide. So this is, this is a project where I think that, and, and I'll leave it here. This is a project where, you know, we're seeing East meets West. And we're actually, we're, you know, actually developing our first high speed rail where we're understanding that this project, how the funding is coming together and things and, and understanding like, what is this station going, what are these stations going to look like in Texas with the high speed rail, the next generation of this. And it's very inspiring. And that's what brings me back to, we have to be really with this East-West uh, relationship versus what we've been um, imagining with Europe. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. It's uh, pretty fascinating because it almost felt like in the last 30 minutes we went around the world. And uh, that kind of like brings us to time. But uh, as an urban designer, this conversation has been really important personally for me. Uh, you know, we've all heard of deja vu, but I'm not sure whether you've heard of this idea of Wuja Day. It happens when you enter a situation You've been in a thousand times before, but with a sense of being there for the first time. Uh, today, I feel that because I feel like we've had these conversations so many times, but what we've heard from each panelist almost feels like, you know, this is the first time it's being brought up and smoke, spoken in a candid manner. Uh, we have received such incredible questions, uh, but of course we are at time. Um, our panelists did say that they will uh, hang out for a little bit longer if uh, we want to address some questions. Our panelists, a lot of the questions were actually hinged on uh, affordable housing but uh, do want to uh, conclude the formal portion of this presentation on time and, and uh, thank the panelists, thank our audience. I mean, just uh, sharing and hearing uh, the way you all define the places you live in using one word is truly inspiring. And our goal as designers, as policymakers, is to enhance that narrative and build that sense of identity. Uh, this is part of the Limitless webinar series at HKS. It happens quarterly. The next one is actually focused on the future of workplace in August. So please definitely look out for signing up. Uh, my uh, colleague and actually the global director of our uh, JEDI initiatives, Giselle, uh, has been dropping some very important links on the chat. She's our sponsor, so I truly value this uh, opportunity. But uh, for those of you who have to move on to your next uh, Zoom meeting, uh, you are uh, free to do so. Thank you for joining. But um, uh, if you're interested, you know, I, I could post that first question and it looks like it was uh, asked uh, with Rachel and uh, Debbie in mind. Uh, there was this question about 
when you have public agencies directly involved in building affordable housing, how is this done? Is this through partnerships? How is this development funded? And the second part of that question is what happens when you receive a pushback from the community, say that, uh, let's say that what's being proposed is actually a homeless shelter. Uh, how do you deal with that pushback? So let's start with Rachel and then move on to Debbie. So in that case, uh, the, the one that the person cited in the chat box, um, this is a penned off. And I think what we need to do is people who support affordable housing, equity, inclusiveness, diversity need to come out. Because often what happens is we only hear from the people who are against something, not for something. And so democracy at its best when uh, people engage and share their views about why this matters, how we have to take care of all people. And that, that would be huge. But in the meantime, we're, um, we've, a task force has been formed by the supervisor for this area, Dan Stork. And we're going to show the group, the task force, other shelters that are in uh, neighborhoods. There's one, I it's either Alexandria or Arlington that's combined with another public facility. And there's one in Montgomery County. And so it really helps if they can see an actual example there's, there are others, they're further away, but uh, so that we can get to a place within a reasonable uh, distance, we're, we're doing that. And then in terms of the affordable housing, so we require developers to do a portion of their housing for affordability. There was a question about Mosaic. Um, it's not all condos, it's mostly rental. And uh, the, uh, the for sale product are, are private homes, they're town, town homes. Um, but the, uh, the uh, rental housing has affordable and workforce housing component to it. We have percentages that are required, but that was built 10 plus years ago. We, uh, the, the county has upped that more and more and more and stepped up more to just put in money for our redevelopment and housing authority, our department of housing and community development that is a developer. We're building uh, North Hill on Route 1. Pendaw includes affordable housing. The neighbors aren't against the affordable component, they're against the, the homeless com component, just to clarify. And um, as I'd said earlier, uh, scattered site housing is huge so that people can live in Tysons who have lower incomes um, and in our wealthier areas. So these are some of the things we're doing. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Debbie, what about Marta? How are you yeah. partnering for affordable housing? So our developments are, are definitely happening by, by our development partners. So in the, the instance of affordable housing, in most cases, our development partners are approaching our development authorities within the local municipalities. And for instance, in Atlanta, that would be Invest Atlanta. So there may be TIF opportunities or TADs. I think in Atlanta, it's TADs, um, tax uh, uh, allocation districts. So areas within those tax allocation districts are given you know, resources to help meet the affordable, desired affordability of, of new residential coming online. And in some cases, the um, preservation of affordable housing. And then there's the, the state program called um, LIHTC or Low Income Housing Tax Credits. And some of our development partners have pursued those opportunities. For instance, at our Avondale station, our development partner pursued low income housing tax credits to um, de de develop a 92 unit senior housing development. And um, currently we have a, the, the housing authority in DeKalb County, they were successful in the most recent round of LIHTC to do a 250 unit mixed use development with a component of those units being um, workforce and senior housing. Um, in terms of home, homeless shelters, we have not encountered that as of yet in, in Metro Atlanta, but I will tell you, we spent probably a year engaging the community um, in um, what the community really desired at our Oakland City Station. And they wanted to see a vibrant mixed use community that introduced housing, retail opportunities, a grocery store, so truly mixed use. The um, proposal that we received for development at that station was a LIHTC deal. 
and the community expressed their disappointment in what was submitted, that it did not have a mixed use component and really shared with MARTA and its leadership and our board that this is not what we talked about. This is not the creative placemaking that we had envisioned for Oakland City. And through that process, and this was a year long engagement that we had with the community with uh, Transformation Alliance as a, as a nonprofit organization here, we made the decision be, being MARTA to actually um, cancel that TOD opportunity until we can um, go back out and make sure we're presenting and, and, and someone is presenting the, the idea of, of what the community wants. In this particular case, I found it interesting when the community said, we have our fair share of affordable units. We want to raise the bar and begin introducing um, more market rate units to, to blend in. So there's an opportunity for a lot of different people to live in this community and not just solely people who are needing affordable housing, because we think that will help bring the, the, the Starbucks and the coffee shops and the different retail uses that we would like to see, because we know, you know, people are quick to say, well, what are the income levels here in order to support that new grocery store that you would like to see? So I thought that was a very interesting um, situation. Now, keep in mind, that was probably about five years ago, and the community is slowly, definitely changing. So it'll be interesting to see once we're putting the RFP back out, we have a, a transit component coming into that station. So we're having to pause any TOD activity until we, we um, um, complete that uh, transit expansion opportunity along Camelton Road. But it'll be interesting to see if that still stands because now it may be a situation where they're finding themselves really losing affordability because more people are, are moving in to the to the neighborhood and, and things have switched so it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out in the end yeah and, and actually you ended up answering a couple of questions because there was some curiosity about that mix of uses which actually brings me to two questions so we'll post the first one to shupratham and then uh would uh, address the second to carla uh shupratham when you talked about just looking at you know market study trends and what goes inside of the building you also talked about resiliency, right? So there's been a question about what, where does open space fall in all of this? Like, and how can open space not just be leftover space? How do you program that? Can you touch on that a little bit? I, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great, I saw, the, I saw that question also, also in, um, in, um, in, in the chat box. I mean, we do a lot of thinking about open space and open space planning um, as part of our, we have a sort of, you know, as part of our own practice, both in terms of, you know, how do you think about open space, but how do you also sort of operate and manage and fund open space on a long-term basis? Um, I, I think the first thing I would say, and this applies to open space, but applies to a lot of other things as well, especially when you get into a, an existing historical community is, you know, the, the old age dictum of, of do no harm, right? So, so what happens a lot in the open space sort of thing is, first of all, I think sometimes open spaces are designed to keep certain people out, you know? And um, there wasn't a time very long back, uh, certainly in parts, even parts of New York City, right? Where, you know, if you had a great open space, like a real jewel, only certain members of the community would actually get keys to enter the park. Now, that is at one end of the spectrum, right? But I think what Shiva, what you and your colleagues do is a big part of this about how do you create urban design and planning so you can make sort of spaces, physical spaces welcoming, right? Um, you know, how do you, you know, figuratively and so literally take down the barrier, so to speak. The other piece of this is what you touched on, which is programming. Like, how do you make spaces which are, which are programmed where everyone, regardless of their income levels, race, ethnicity, feel that they're not just welcomed, but there is something going on over there, 
over at a certain point in time, whether it's a weekend or a weekday or whatever it is, that actually speaks to what they would like to do or what they would like to hear or what they would like to sort of participate in. So I think there are both two pieces to this in my mind. And this, this, is, this is sort of a conversation beyond TOD actually, which is and around healthy communities, which is one is about the actual sort of architecture and the urban design part of it. How do we create welcoming spaces? Okay, and not use that as leftover space that we are going to contribute something as part of a larger sort of zoning strategy or a regulatory strategy. And two, once that we have created those spaces as welcoming spaces, how do we program those spaces so the programming itself is, is welcoming and focuses on the needs and desires of the community? So for example, like if, if this community is in a food desert, for example, can we bring programming around farmer's market or things of that sort on weekends, which, you know, is a, is a great idea for programming in an open space, but also specifically meets that desire or the lack in that specific community. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And actually, we can uh, connect it to the fact that uh, like even doing like a GIS based analysis and understanding the context and where the gaps are so that our open spaces and our buildings are contextually sound, I think is a great way to build uh, resiliency, too. So that brings us to the last uh, question. And it's uh, uh, kind of been like this recurring theme, I think, through uh, a lot of the presentations in terms of questions that we saw blowing up both in the Q&A and in chat. So Carla, you mentioned about the ITS system versus the fair free system. Uh, yeah. So the question is, what has been the biggest obstacle when implementing a component fair free system integrated within a regional mobility authority system? And if that is even something that we can aspire to, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. So one of the things that we have to start looking at is like I kept talking about East versus West. We really don't have a good idea of how to tech forward in, in the United States. We, we have a big digital divide. And so when I spoke of ground truthing and informed practice, the fact that our design teams and our implementation teams are not made up of local professionals uh, that represent these different cultures, it means that when we, when we design, when we try to implement an ITS system or integrate that system, it doesn't, we, we don't know how it's going to fall. And so therefore there's, there's the folks that are really pro tech. Like we, we really do get into the weeds on the tech and then we don't understand actually how it hits the ground. So then you have a folks that are at the transit agency that they've been there a long time, right? And they really don't necessarily understand the tech but they wanna be cool. So they wanna adopt the technology because there's an assumption that it will create um, a cost savings and cost savings or an efficiency. But they but because they don't have informed practice of understanding how that's that that is used, and that's where we're where I always talk about go that we have to have more folks going to Asia, spending time in these train stations where there are thousands and thousands of people an hour using the transit and understanding how that how a high density train station or or transit port, you know, port works. And so therefore there's, a, and then we have the dystopia that I was talking about, the Western dystopia of the homelessness, the violence and things. So when you put all those factors together, folks get really scared when they talk about free transit. Cause the first thing they think of is the dystopian factor, or you think of, you know, the, the, it, you're, you're, you're thinking of, okay, well, this ITS system is going to provide efficiencies and cost savings. And so these are the myths that we, we have to actually look at, but we can't look at those things until we actually understand how they perform in, in, you know, in at best practice. And so that's the work that at Smart Cohort that we do is we have, make sure to get informed practice, which is making sure you have the right folks. So you, we work with universities, we work with other researchers, we work with um, you know, transit folks that are already doing this work and they're at the local levels, you put those folks together to get an informed cohort that can then start talking about, okay, what can we do? Then you understand where the legislation and the governance is. Like, is this really something that folks want? Do they want a free transit system? How are their budgets really set up 
to be able to do this. Because in some cases, some trans agencies subsidize a lot of the ride, the rides. So some trans agencies actually depend on fare box revenue. And so these are the things that we have to better understand is how is that paid for? Can it be done? Is there enough, uh, you know, do, is, is the system, can it bear that? We, you know, uh, you, meaning the increase of ridership as well as the increase of say said problems like homelessness or, or folks riding the train. Is this something that, you know, we can do? And that's, that's where we look, you know, look at instead of it, we have an in, engagement and it's not just get engagement on, we look at it as team versus engagement. And so I, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated rubric as you can see, but you understand that if we get something like the circulator that folks are in, in DC, or, you know, or other types of, of things that have a more free component, you see that that does get ridership up and it works. Then you have a, the best practice in, in Seattle. Washington is probably the only place where we actually have ridership that's very high um, and that's meeting its targets. Orca card, which is their transit card, is, is given by agencies, by at schools, you know, and other places. So that, that cost burden is not bared on the, the actual rider as much. And so then we can see, like, if there's measures of what free transit looks like. Um, it, is, it doesn't necessarily have to be free free. It can be it, the, the cost burden is shared on another end. I, I know that's complicated, but that's uh, that's kind of where we are with the fair trans, the free free fair transit. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I uh, really want to thank the panelists for spending some extra time addressing some key questions. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Giselle. <laughs> sure. I Shiva, you did a phenomenal job wrapping it up you know, earlier today. So I have I have very little to say, but to thank uh, the moderator. Thank you, Shiva. Thank you, Kate and Ashley for helping put this together. Thank you to our phenomenal panelists. Thank you for the extra time that you're sharing time here with us. Um, and I'm, I'm always incredibly grateful when I hear these, uh, when I'm part of these conversations that are always centered and centering people at the core of what we do and how we do it. And th that's part of the conversation. We wanna amplify the voices of the people that are doing the great work for the people that are elevating the underrepresented and really elevating this idea of Jedi in design, Jedi in community. I love how we kept going back to trans-oriented community, people-centered design, centering people, centering, building community, centering collaboration, and being, being facilitators and conveners and, and being active participants and intentional in how we, how we approach these systems. So I'm always incredibly inspired every time uh, we put these things together. Thank you, Shiba, again. Um, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you very much for the 136 people that decided to, to stay here almost two hours, I'm, I'm flattered. And again, a I, I, I reminder, this is in a series. Uh, we hope to put these together quarterly to elevate the conversation of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and design. Um, we, we talked about in November about the future of senior living. The one in February was about equitable development. Uh, this one, of course, is social equity and transit-oriented communities. Love that. The next one will be about the future of workplace in this hybrid new environment of collaboration and acknowledgement. And we hope to see you there in August. And we'll continue these conversations. And thank you again for, for the amazing honor of having you uh, today share your thoughts. Thank you for the great work. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>